everyone to the first edition of the SDG Action Conclave 2020. And we are conducting today's session focusing on SDG Goal 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth. To start off the session, let me tell you a bit about our organization, Youth Forum under Alexis Society. So, Youth Forum is a project under Alexis Society and our team consists of inspired young students and professionals who are solely interested in creating positive social impact by conducting research on policy issues, writing thought-provoking and insightful blogs, designing creative social campaigns, organizing life-changing events and interviewing leaders and change makers. As it is correctly said that the youth are not only leaders of tomorrow, but also partners of today. So a team of creative and encouraging individuals with a shared mission, a mission to change the world. So through this first edition of the SDG Action Conclave, we wish to bring together the change makers and the leaders from around the globe under the hashtag act for SDGs campaign week of the United Nations. It will help to prepare an actionable agenda that will aid in achieving all the sustainable development goals through all stakeholder initiatives and more. While the world leaders meet virtually at the United Nations General Assembly to grapple the issues and give a solution to the tough times, we are trying to do a small bit by taking action and raising awareness and initiating a better direction ahead. The turning point of the planet and the people needs to be now. Today, we have Mr. Vincent Molinari, sir, with us. Sir is the founder and CEO of Molinari Media and fintech.tv, a media company focused in fintech, blockchain, SDGs, and ESG. He works on highlighting the work of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals on the Impact Show and how ESG investing plays a role in this worldwide initiative and it broadcasts on the fintech.tv, YouTube, and network cable TV, and soon CNBC Africa, which resulted in 6 million viewers. He is also responsible for powering the next summit for Climate Week at New York City from 21st to 24th of September, 2020. Some of his notable awards include United Nations Global Compact 2013, Leader Summit Delegate, 2014 Kingonomics Emancipation of Capital Award, Emerging Markets, 2016 Impact Frederick Douglass Award, Male Champion of Global Women's Equality, IGD Frontier 100 Leader. He also serves on various boards as a global advisory council member, including Impact Leadership 21, Operation Water, Cornerstone Capital Group. He is a speaker for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, as well as the US Department of State International Visitor Leadership Program. Namaste, sir. Now, we also have with us the chair of the SDG Action Conclave 2020, Mr. Kunal Mandal, sir. Sir is the founder of Gyan Space, a gamification company which uses quizzes and other games as a tool for personal growth and people engagement and citybytesindia.com, a travel portal which helps travelers discover and book inspiring city experiences provided by local experts. Currently, he is on a mission to teach curiosity as a life skill increase awareness about sustainability and empower young Indians to be more than they thought could be. So now I would like to request Kunal sir to take the session forward. Thank you so much Sangyukta and hello and a very warm welcome to each and every one of you who is joining in and listening in. I have a very very special guest with me today and he is Vincent Molinari and Vince a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh my goodness a warm welcome that was uh, an extraordinarily warm welcome. 
Sangeeta, thank you so much. Uh, so very kind. And uh, Kunal, uh, I am thrilled and honored to be here today. Thank you. It's a really, really honor and pleasure to have you with us, Vince. Now, you know, quickly, let's dive into my first question. So I have been speaking to quite a few people uh, during our uh, speaker session and this Global Goals Week. And one key thread that comes up in every discussion is that to achieve these goals by 2030, we need funds. And you have uh, had close to 30 years of experience in the financial services industry, you have been an entrepreneur with many projects and businesses and strongly advocate the development of blockchain patents as well. We'll come to that. But since financial aid and, uh, you know, finance has one of been one of the key strengths of yours. My question to you is, how do we find funds to achieve these goals uh, by 2030? Well, Kunal, and I think you're a hundred percent right. As we look at the globe today, as we look at our planet, it is the engagement, and, and, and I'll touch on uh, SDG 17, collaboration and partnerships, right? To me, it is breaking down those silos. It is the levels of collaboration, and it's the engagement with private sector. And I think this goes to the core that, you know, profit for us is not a dirty word, and profit creates sustainability, and that sustainability is what we need to create systemic change. So if we look at that in the construct of achieving the goals of 2030, it is about inclusiveness. It is about private-public partnerships. It, it is about engaging technology to level set and exponentiate. So for me, it is really looking at how do we look at new pathways of engagement? Part of what we do, frankly, at FinTech TV Network and the Impact Show is really bringing visibility and awareness, right? To bring uh, levels of actionable knowledge so that we can bring forward initiatives that are so important to our planet and for humanity. And then how do we engage in open hearts so that we can uh, engage with passion and people understanding one another. And, and our hope is that uh, that allows for new capital flows, that those flows can move to people's passion, their values that are aligned with particular SDGs or the SDGs overall. So we think it does come back to the levels of engagement that we've been really um, failing on, frankly, and, and really scaling the levels of private sector engagement to the SDGs. Yeah, I mean, as you rightfully said, probably, uh, you know, all the goals are so interconnected and, and, and sort of funds being a key driver in every force, probably we need more participation and more collaboration to make it happen. And private and, uh, you know, sort of public partnership is going to be one of the key ways to do it. And glad to hear about Impact TV. And of course, we'll, we'll talk about it more. Uh, but uh, let's, let's move into... Uh, since we are talking about finance and aid and, and sort of uh, achieving SDGs, you have created a fund called SDG Impact Fund, which uh, facilitates charitable giving and makes it very convenient, flexible and efficient for donors and also helps them maximize their philanthropy through uh, donor advised funds. Uh, now, to, to, I mean, to take this forward, uh, in a way, this is uh, one of the ways you have revamped the, the finance puzzle for SDGs. What would be your suggestions that how do we actually go on revamping the finance sector more and more so that we actually drive the capital for change or, as you said, profit towards more purpose? Yeah, and, and it's just a question, Kunal, that I think is amazing and I think... Uh... Uh, needs to be thought about more. We certainly spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, for us, it's a bit of evolution, right? Uh, what worked yesterday uh, doesn't necessarily work today. And what's going to be the future could be materially different. So I think when we, we, we pause for a moment um, and we think about what's available, I, I truly believe that we have so many resources on our planet to help solve for the issues that we are facing. But it's, it's our own level of personal responsibility to think about it differently. How do we engage? How do we change um, things for the better? So for us with SDG Impact Fund was, I'd say, almost one leg of a three-legged stool to think about how do we almost turn things on the head a bit, 
right? How do we think about uh, a philanthropy differently? How do we think about engaging that in a level that targets it more to the purpose of the individual, right? How do we think, and one of the early things that we did at SDG Impact uh, Fund was to take appreciated assets, right? Much as you can do for a donor advised fund and stocks and bonds and cash, but think about cryptocurrency and digital assets to be donated at appreciated value. So our thought stream was partly going to some of the youth, some of the next generation wealth creators, was that we had many global uh, newly minted millionaires that were change agents that were looking to be disrupted, and they created wealth, and then all of a sudden facing taxable liabilities that they didn't anticipate in the past. So what a beautiful mechanism if you could parlay that into something that moves capital towards the SDGs and engage participants, frankly, in that philanthropic work that traditionally weren't there or there in the size and scope. So we, we, we looked at changing that model and, and having the ability to customize, to have an independent uh, donor advised fund in the SDG impact that allowed the donors to channel or dictate where they wanted that capital to go to. Right? So that, that, that is one leg. The other leg is, we, we'll, again, we'll talk more about FinTech TV and the impact, is really the visibility and the awareness to create um, knowledge around the challenges. So we could match then, well, we can philanthropic dollars to that, like the SDG Impact Fund and others, but also now how do we move that private sector capital? How do we think about traditional financial markets globally that we could create product, right? Part of that is uh, our initiative that we're rolling out, sustainable securities. How do we create instruments that have the muscle memory, if you would, the structures of a municipal bond, a debt instrument, a blue bond, a green bond, uh, ETFs that are that fit in our financial service infrastructure, but have new wrappers, right? New wrappers that adhere to the SDGs, climate change, ESG integration, so that they could fit into the massive buckets of investable capital. So we're not just going after the portion that uh, people typically look at a tax deductibility aspect from, but here's their core portfolio and an asset allocation model that could be it in the trillions of dollars that move toward the purpose of what one's investments are begun. Wow, I mean, that's that's right there, a, a very sort of interesting blueprint for everyone who is listening in. I mean, if you are in the finance sector, look at how Vince is trying to change the system and actually building something which inside the system can can be fit into the existing financial ecosystem and still make that, uh, you know, profit for purpose happen. So great to, great to hear that, Vince. But tell us a little more about, uh, you know, the Impact TV and, and because you said that... Uh, visibility also drives capital so how are you doing that at impact tv and other initiatives that that you briefly uh, mentioned well could you, you you uh very intuitively uh or received it and and, re and said something you know the inside right so part of our core thesis is um the collaboration right it is not you know doing this of, you know, traditional capital markets, our social entrepreneurs never shall the two collaborate, right? So for us, this was a recognition of thinking about it from an inward out movement, right? So if we look and, and we're so fortunate and very blessed as FinTech TV that we broadcast from the New York Stock Exchange, from NASDAQ, uh, London Stock Exchange Studios, uh, and soon to be many other global exchanges. So that uh, almost metamorphosis as we'd like to look at it. Right. We have the benefit of some of the largest uh, capital markets around the world and, and soon to be, I think you'll see about a dozen more that we're broadcasting from that are bringing new narratives. Right. So those new narratives are, are creating relevancy. Right. So when you could then take the um, I'd say credibility of traditional capital markets, that they're engaging these new conversations. They're engaging new conversations and demystifying. Part of it, this is demystifying subjects that are new and meaningful of blockchain. Well, what is the difference between Bitcoin and blockchain? What is the blockchain technology and how do we enable that across the spectrum, whether that is things for identity, delivering aid, capital markets, evolution, efficiency, transparency? And then how do we talk about the SDGs, right? How do we bring that forward to understand, my goodness, that why is financial inclusion, gender equality so important? Why is fair and good work 
and creating opportunity so important, not just to the individuals, but to our planet and our ecosystem. So we, we tend to call it actionable knowledge. So the more information and knowledge that we can put into a system, the more likely you're going to have someone take action. And that action can be uh, as simplistic as it sounds in self-awareness and understanding and perhaps receiving this information on things that are typically underspoken about or not spoken about at all in mainstream media. So to have a broadcast platform where we could talk about some of the greatest challenges facing humanity, but also on the other side of great innovators, disruptors that are solving and moving towards solutions for those. So all of a sudden, I think you're changing the very engagement. Right? You're changing that engagement. And we tend to say opening hearts. Right? So we, we typically talk about how do, we, how do we get into someone's head? How do we open their minds? We think it's quite the opposite. Right? If we can touch and lead with an open heart, where then then it flows to the mind, right? So now you're creating a wonderful feedback loop that is from an open heart to an open mind. And now you're changing the very essence. And it, we hope awakening in, within individuals this level of unconsciousness that they have, that they want to bring something forward. So for us, it really comes back to this level of foundational uh, being true to the core and trying to bring this visibility, awareness, education forward, and then how do we catalyze that to action across the spectrum? No, it's, it's lovely to hear you know all the things that you said because uh, through this conclave and even at sometimes at my work, I'm, I'm I'm sort of the champion of curiosity. I keep beating its drums all the time to everyone I meet, and I think that's very very important because here that that awakening that you talked about and and how that curiosity, if you just make them curious, it'll just open their hearts and minds and then probably enable them to do better things with it. So I think, uh, you know, it's great to hear how FinTech TV and Impact, uh, you know, TV is it's trying to demystify that 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 stigma or, or at least simplify things for all of us. Because sometimes when it, you hear the word finance, you just, you know, say, oh, I don't understand anything of it. But the fact that now you are trying to do that is probably inspire everyone who is listening in. Please check these uh, channels out. They have some excellent content and, of course, help you understand how to drive finance and how to pr drive profit towards purpose. Um, at this point, I mean, there are a couple of things you mentioned uh, while answering the question. That is uh, the blockchain and other technologies that you have been championing for quite some time. So I will sort of dive into that uh, a little bit. And uh, you have always truly believed that blockchain technology is the need of the hour and is probably the mantra behind the success of uh, you know, businesses to move it forward. And you have used it as a skeleton behind most of the businesses that you have set up. So could you tell us a little more about it from the context that how it actually helps solve humanitarian issues on the ground and how it has helped you uh, do things in a greater way and a better way? Well, and, and thank you, Kanal. And, and this is um, part of the passion and part of the life work. And I think we are very early in the process, right? And the things that we're beginning to not only realize that could be done, but really for uh, market participants, for consumers, uh, for corporations to really start to think how things like blockchain, uh, what, what, what I like to say, technologies that will allow us to exponentiate how we can begin to take quantum leaps and i think the galvanizing part and i have to say you know when i look at the great blessings of my co-founders troy mcguire uh, you know just you know i get to brag about him because he doesn't so humble doesn't brag about himself but to have a multi emmy award winning producer to step in and become a partner and realize how powerful the paradigm shift is kavita gupta Kavita is, you know, from the, the World Bank to IFC to Eric Schmidt's family office impact and uh, establishing consensus ventures. Uh, Kavita is just amazing in this in this representation of this mosaic of finance from the highest levels to impact to one of the most innovative technology thinkers. So I, I am so blessed and fortunate to have co-founders like that who have allowed this construct to be birthed and continue to morph. So, as you say, Kunal, the um, blockchain fame framework is so important, and I'll share with you a couple of reasons why 
across the spectrum. So I think it allows this decentralization, this level of communication, this consensus building that is transcending not only finance, but as you say, uh, civil society. How do we get to the ground, right? And, and I think the base of the pyramid, right? How do we engage in that last mile of connectivity that we've talked so long about? How do we get to that? Well, I believe this is truly the solution. So when you look at blockchain being enabled, you're thinking about wallet creations within blockchains that are coming from very simple SMS phones, right? So when we think about mass populations around the world, right, from India to the continent of Africa to the rest of the globe, where we can now touch the farmer on the ground who is doing work and how do we begin to integrate blockchain technology to ensure proper payment, right? The, the not exploitation of that farmer. We, it's mind boggling when we think about the amount of farmers who are actually starving and people, well, how can a farmer be starving? Well, it, it, you, you, you go through the process and say, well, now that we can put crops, we can have a marketplace where they can get fair pricing, how they can get perhaps financing in non-traditional ways based upon consensus building because they don't have a credit profile, right? So when we think about delivering humanitarian aid, and that aid being immutable, not being able to be corrupted or stolen because it is tied directly to the need. When we talk about refugee camps, when we talk about the levels of identity and having records of individuals on that chain that, that are secure, well, now we can begin to think about how do we create revenue and income for that individual who may want to share some of that identity, some of their personal data. We look at that as sovereignty of yourself, sovereignty of your own data. So you can begin to look at who you may want to share that data with in organizations, companies, and receive things like Green Fence that is doing amazing work and dropping rewards and incentives directly to wallets based upon people sharing levels of information in organizations. So it's not being scraped by mega, mega organizations and, and using it to their own benefit, how do we directly move that benefit to a one-to-one -one connectivity to all that need that? We talk about media. We talk about things that we're doing on the back end of FinTech TV where we can allow the individual soon to be rewarded for content consumption that they're receiving based upon organizations and, and people that they care about. So you're creating this one-to-one -one connectivity to corporations, brands, and their consumers. Very powerful. We talk about how do we look at the evolution of finance, right? And we talked about it yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So our technology ability is well advanced in front of our regulatory approvals and understanding. So part of it is modernization of securities law that intersects globally with these new paradigms of the power of the technology. So I think this all, you know, and I won't go too far into it today, but I think it really will challenge us to think about what money is as we go forward. What money was 100, 200 years ago is dramatically different today. So I think we're going to see this evolution of continue, of, of monetary compensation. And I, I, I'll, I'll leave this with you for curiosity and thought. Well, what if we could be think about our economic engagement and our reward system Oh my goodness, what if we rewarded empathy and love and kindness and economic consideration versus just our traditional financial rewards? Wow, wouldn't that incentivize change behavior where we then can lead again with kindness and empathy and have rewards for that? I think that could be a very, very powerful change agent. Wow, I mean, I, I really like how you have turned empathy into a currency, and probably that's the need of the hour. And you know, and truly said, I mean, the more empathy that we have towards people, the world will be much kinder. And if we have that as a currency, I guess the concept of money probably need to rethink. Absolutely right. And I like how how you spoke about some of the things which are very close to my heart as well, which is you know sort of you you in a way gamified the content consumption ecosystem where you know people are being rewarded for consuming good content or content that is more meaningful at the same time uh, you know you are rewarding uh, good in the world i guess that is something that we need to sort of rethink and come up with and, and of course we have come a long way 
of uh, you know using money a stone as a money or you know cory cells as a money and and now you know you know a paper bill which you know no one knows where it comes from and of course from gold standard to everything else that has changed uh, for us so i guess it's time very much time for evolve to think how technology can redefine money and uh, and it sounds really good of the things that you are doing uh let me let me you know, can i just before we go to the, the yeah, next yeah, question please you know and you, you you've I've, I've received what you're saying then i just just have to respond slightly because i think it is uh really uh, a little window into the future and i and i know gamification uh is so important to to things that you're doing and we look at it but i i do believe and i don't i don't think it's terribly off in the future as we look at content and we look at our at least at the moment fourth industrial revolution type technologies on the back end blockchain ai machine learning i think the next component to really content consumption and engagement is really going to be these immersive experiences and when we blend in levels of gamification for rewards and engagement particularly when we talk about uh our next generation youth engagement and we have levels of virtual reality and augmented reality into our content, I think we're really going to change the paradigm and the engagement of that content consumption. Yes, absolutely. I I'm, I'm totally agree uh, with whatever you've said. I mean, let's let's hope that that happens sooner than later. And uh, you know, let me slightly dive deeper into the blockchain uh, part of the discussion and of course i i was doing a little bit of research and i saw that the blockchain commission for sustainable development uh, hosts which which you run and hosts uh, the blockchain for impact global summit as well which is designed to serve the growing community of conscious leadership reflecting the full breadth of the global blockchain ecosystem and there was a publication that i came across which was the future is decentralized blockchains uh, distributed le ledgers and uh, the future of sustainable development that's what i think the title of the paper was uh, two terms that came across one was do no harm and design with not for uh, in the context of blockchain technology so i thought let me ask you what do you mean when you said those words and and what do they actually mean could you help our young audience understand a bit on that yeah so, so thank you kuno i was so fortunate and blessed to have amazing co-founders in amir dasal and sergio fernandez de corva uh in 2017 uh, we were very fortunate during anga and the sdg media zone to launch the blockchain commission for sustainable development and blockchain for impact and that was really a goal to, to look at how do we engage with member states, right? So again, going back to this notion of demystifying, you know, if you could imagine uh, here in the United States, much of the work that I did with uh, regulators, the SEC, FINRA, CFTC, Senate and Congress, when you're first walking in that door in 2016, 2017, you know, what is this guy talking about, right? Uh, very similar when we began to engage with the member states. And I'm so pleased and proud when you look today, you know, just three years later, uh, as Anga is next week, the level of engagement with member states, the United Nations, engaging and embracing digital transformation, engaging the power of what blockchain technologies can do globally for member states. And so much of that goes back to the core of doing no harm and looking at some of the least developed countries, less developed countries and level setting, right? So how do we take consensus? How do we take the ability to have voices involved in the process, right? So many times we found ourselves with dislocation from those who are involved and are suffering the outcomes, people trying to give them the benefit, and we miss the mark, right? Because decisions are being made up top, perhaps without those voices at the table. And I think this is goes to the core of climate injustice. It goes to the core of what I'd like to say are so many symptoms when we talk about them. Gender inequality, lack of financial inclusion, racism, uh, slave labor, human trafficking, right? 
for me goes back, those are horrible, horrible symptoms of the problem. The problem is our dehumanizing of one another. The fact that we've forgotten who our neighbor is. We've forgotten that this is one planet. We've forgotten that we are all here together. So we've, we've desensitized ourselves, made us callous that it's, oh, some far off part of the land. Oh, we don't know who it is. We've forgotten, frankly, that what happens in the Amazon, the deforestation, the lack of our ability to reduce carbon, put oxygen in the air, affects climate all over the world. We've forgotten that what happens in our oceans and overfishing and our pollution of plastics and killing our coral reefs is all connected. Why our glaciers, our polar caps in the Nordics are melting. So for the do no harm begins to think about how do we use blockchain? How do we construct to be fully encompassing, to have voices and consensus at the table and the level of not having that data information and process corrupted where it becomes immutable. So it begins that decentralized, that ability to bring voices, to create engagement in manners that we haven't had and come out with outcomes. You know, for me, it goes to the very much the essence of the core of the wisdom of the crowd. And if we believe that the more voices, the more inputs that we have into decision making, we're going to come out with the best outcomes. Well, frankly, this is the best enabler when we look at blockchain globally to achieve those results. Wow, bringing more voices to, to be involved in the process. That's uh, so well put. Now, I mean, at this point, I, I can't, uh, you know, sort of help but uh, quote you. I was uh, reading one of your interviews in which you said that blockchain features, uh, blockchain features and philosophy lend themselves perfectly to create new and innovative methods to connect private and public sectors in order to advance capital flows to the SDGs and aid in 2030 goals being accomplished. Now, uh, we all know that private sectors are more profit centric. So when you actually enabled with, with everything that you are doing more partnerships and more togetherness of the public and private partnership, what are some challenges that you faced or did you see that it was uh, like, is it being now possible to sort of move those profit centric companies slightly towards uh, uh, these goals? Wow. Um, great, great question. I ha ha have to sit up straight for this one. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think I'm going to ring the bell. Uh, and, and I think we are, we are, we are at the point in time where it is indeed different. I, I, and again, part of this evolution, we've had this historic conflict, right? Between maximization of profit, doing good, and those were somewhat mutually exclusive, or to the extent they were not recognized at being one and the same. So um, part of uh, Climate Week, New York City 2020 last week, the Nest Summit, uh, I'll talk very briefly about a couple of outcomes and things that happened there because I think they are monumental. I think they're monumental in the signals. One of the things that we look to as part of FinTech TV is hearing the signals from the noise, right? A lot of noise, but you start to see very defined signals based upon what is being spoken about, what is being consumed, and what is resonating. So I think we're really starting to see the beginning of a tectonic shift where we're moving from what was nice to do from corporations in their marketing department saying, hmm, yeah, go see that office down the hall. There, there are CSR, ESG, SRI, Impact, right? Whatever title through the process, right? And yeah, they're doing something that's really nice for our brand. We're going core to the middle of risk now, right? I think corporations are uh, understanding a couple of things. They're understanding the fact that the world has changed. I think part of COVID-19 globally has forced us all to take a pause, to, to rethink to recenter what's important about us, what have we been doing really wrong, and how do we begin to repair that and move forward again with that open heart to 
what's important to all of us and begin to take personal responsibility and be a good steward for our planet. Well, I can tell you that's resonating in the C-suites of corporations around the world, right? Because we're now recognizing they have a fiduciary responsibility to their stakeholders, much different than, hey, this is nice from a marketing department, a nice to do versus this is going right to your profit and loss statement. This is going right to your exposure. So I believe corporations are now engaging at different levels and looking to engage private public partnerships, engage in how they they look at their consumers. We're seeing very much, very much, and this is so important, I believe, consumers becoming stakeholders and stakeholders becoming consumers in organizations in which they believe in. Now, because of the levels of transparency, right, social media, blockchain exposures, corporations are being exposed for their conduct, that conduct that is good and bad, right? So where we have representation of female C-suite organizations, and we have to start talking about more board of directors of women, right? How corporations treat their workforce. What is their true, true mechanisms of evaluating su supply chain? What is their sourcing of the product? Are, are there fair wages? Again, going back to, to slave labor, human trafficking things, and being able to expose that because of visibility and supply chain. So I think we're seeing what is going to be the power of the pocketbook and the wallet that are not only impacting consumer engagement, consumer loyalty, but I think you're very much going to see valuations of corporations in the public and private sector being impacted by those who are doing a good job and start to get higher valuations, lower cost of capital. And I think those who continue to go on the old world path of maximization of short term profit at the expense of our planet and our people will begin to see uh, valuations dramatically impacted on the downside, less people interested in funding those organizations, so higher cost of capital. So I do think that we're in this uh, transition period for the first time that really excites me. Thank you so much for sharing it. And, and as it seems to me that consumer wellness should be the new focus for all the companies and, and whoever, like if there are CEOs who are listening in, please pay attention to whatever Vince has said. There are lots of interesting, uh, you know, suggestions that he had and he gave out uh, through what they have, uh, they have done and what he has seen, uh, how the changes are happening. So please, uh, pay, I hope you paid attention to that. Now, Vince, uh, we talked about, yeah, you wanted to share something? Yeah, I, I was just, if, if I could, uh, uh, two, two quick things, or maybe maybe three that I'll just highlight, because I think they're so important coming out of Climate Week New York City and the Nest Summit. You know, Butch Bacani uh, from the United Nations in Geneva, uh, Principles for Sustainable Insurance. You'll see some great interviews from some of the leading insurance companies uh, in the world with Butch that have now moved to ISDGs, insurance companies for SDGs, right? Hasn't been spoken about. We're so thrilled to be able to amplify that. So insurance companies now looking, I think for the first time, very, very deeply, the impact of climate risk, the impact of things that they didn't factor into underwriting and how they're going to conduct themselves and underwrite pursuant to the SDGs. Um, we had Lynn Martin, uh, ICE, ICE is one of the largest organizations in the world that owns the New York Stock Exchange and many other uh, tradable entities from carbon to, to energy, who is the, the president and chief operating officer of their data business. So talking about how they're now taking the data outcomes across ESG and creating tool sets so investors can begin to evaluate financial service products in new ways and create financial service instruments. Uh, and, and I'll bring forward uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Rustin Benham, Commissioner of, the, of CFTC, uh, as part of his group, just 194-page report that just came out uh, last week on climate risk to the financial service system, right? These are things that haven't been spoken about. And, and I can go on and on from Pat Mitchell to Tom Steyer to leading organizations in Alliance Bernstein and Moody's here in the U.S. who are all engaging in these conversations. So sorry, didn't mean to take us off track, but I think 
those are real action items that, that are now coming out of uh, uh, some cases multi-year conversations about SDGs, about climate change, about ESG integration, and how corporations and global entities are now changing their behavior. Wow, those are really some positive steps that I heard about, and I, I, I hope that uh, they are quickly put into action. And, and coming from insurance companies, that was really good to hear. So thank you so much uh, for sharing, uh, you know, what's happening currently in the world and good steps that we have taken forward for a better world. That's that's really great to hear. Vince, of course, uh, I mean, we have talked about uh, how do we get the money? How do we find technologies to distribute the money to the uh, to some extent the last mile and how do we innovate finance products which we can then build into the existing ecosystem and you know the, the few examples that you have given where we are even getting insurance companies and others to understand the risks that are with climate and so many other things uh, also con conflict is at, at probably at an all-time high around the world and with that, I will come to a question, which is one of the sub targets of the goal, which is access to capital. We spoke about briefly in, in, in various ways, but the matter of the fact remains that, you know, blockchain is still a digital technology and still I was speaking to, uh, you know, someone on uh, uh, one of the other goals and this discussion came up that 4 billion people actually doesn't have access to internet yet in the world. So with all these things and with, you know, more and more people getting displaced every year due to various reasons, internal conflicts, political turmoil and everything else. How do we take the capital to the people who need it for, for change to make, make change happen? Right. So what are your ideas on that? So again, Kuna, you go right to the core of the issue, and I love that. So I, you know, and I and I'll touch on your conflict point to start very quickly. So we we firmly believe where there is opportunity, there is hope, and where there is hope, there is less conflict. Right? So that's that's internal, that's intra-region, uh, that's country to country, and we and we can look at things as very much as travel and tourism. Countries that have robust travel and tourism between them don't have conflict, right? So I think it goes back to looking holistically of how do we take to meet technology solutions that get to a broader um, spectrum of people. And, and, and that applies anywhere. We can talk about um, remote locations. We can talk about villages in Africa. We can talk about uh, what, what are barrios in Latin America. We can talk about inner cities, rural communities in the U.S. We can talk about what, what becomes slums within, within uh India and other areas, right? What do we have to do? We have to create opportunity for education. We have to create opportunity to move capital to those opportunities. So I'll touch on two things that I think are paramount. One is we don't know where the next brilliant invention is coming from. We don't know where the next Einstein of the world is. We don't know who is going to create that next cure for something that is plaguing our world. So whether that is a woman, whether black, brown, white, it doesn't matter, right? So what we're doing in one case, and I, and I have to bring this forward, and, and I, I know we're focusing a, a, a bit on SDG uh, number eight, but I think when we talk about SDG number five and the engagement of women globally, my goodness, how dumb are we? We have 50% practically of the world's population that are women, that are some of the greatest brain trusts that are better stewards of community, that are better stewards of capital. We've quantitatively approved that women who are leading organizations are getting better rates of return, reinvesting more capital into community, yet we don't have women as part of the process. My goodness, we talk about the wisdom of the crowd you cannot have the best outcome if you're excluding nearly 50% of the population in the decision-making process, particularly when we get to talk about initiatives that are central and focused on having those conversations. My goodness. So to me, that extends to crowdfunding, right? One of the proud things here in the United States that I was part of is moving the JOBS Act forward. And part of the JOBS Act was 
the beginning of crowdfunding for securities. So how do we extend through technology? We'll go back to this, right? And also the removal of the ban on general solicitation here in the United States, which means the ability to advertise sec securities for sale, core to looking at social media. So how do we marry social media, the ability to tell stories again, to create visibility around issues that are important to the world, engage affinity groups, fan base, diaspora community into giving them more knowledge through social media, through broadcasting on OTT platforms, but also the ability to say, how do we now connect capital? Because we touched your heart. We've now resonated with your mind. Not only is this important, but oh my goodness, there's a level of profit to be made when we look at my, my goodness, the ability of what's happening in our, our next economy around green business, solar, hydro, wind, these are all investable assets. So if we can now move this to create opportunity to more entrepreneurs, right? Our greatest job creation comes from our ability to innovate, to create jobs from the private sector, and those organizations grow up. And even when they fail, and I think this is very important, we learn from our failings. We get to brag and talk all wonderfully about how successful this initiative was, but you missed the 10 that I did that I crashed against mm -hmm. the wall and got it wrong. But it's within that failure that we learn. It's in with that failure that we iterate and get better for the next one. So I think that it is important that we look at how do we create the best connectivity, even outside blockchain, when we go back to simple ability on SMS phones to create engagement. How do we create new business models that allow us to engage sovereignty of information? My goodness, if we can create more mechanisms where an individual can can monetize some of their data, their identity, to create revenue streams, it's a great beginning. So I think for me, it comes back to technology engagement, social media aspects, and that's the beginning of moving our mindset from scarcity to one of surplus. And when we begin, when we begin, begin to change that, and I, and I have to give a shout out to Alexandra Cousteau, just an amazing advocate uh, a, a steward of the oceans, filmmaker, storyteller. And, and I had the great benefit of doing a seaside chat with her last week. And, and s just a couple of snippets, and I'm sorry, that I just have to bring them forward. Changing our mindset. And she said, uh, just three pearls of many things, but these three pearls of wisdom that, we, that we're so much better than conservation, that we have to move to our thoughts to regeneration right? It's not just enough to preserve what we have today. Let's go back to our abundance, right? She said to me, we have to move from being consumers in our mindset to be contributors, right? So when we look at these mechanisms and, and these very simple statements that Alexandra made, but to go very deep, important and how do we change our engagement? How do we change our narrative? Wow. I mean, that was really, really fascinating points that you made. And I two things that resonated me very much. One is uh, how do we go from uh, being a consumer to being a contributor? And also, uh, there is another point that you made that is... Moving from conservation to regeneration? Yes, yes exactly. Conservation to regeneration. I, my handwriting, I sometimes can't read properly. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I mean, those are those are fascinating point. Like being from being a consumer to being a contributor, and moving from the idea of just conservation to regeneration. Those are like, I mean, exponential. Those are like moonshot ideas, right? If we just change our mindsets, we'll probably be able to, uh, you know, evolve into you know that future itself. So that's that's so so great to hear from you. Now, you know, there are a few things you mentioned in while answering the question. I will write. Uh, you know, quickly dive into the the probably the biggest question that I have for you. That is uh, one of, that is also one of the target uh, of these goal is the global youth employment. And given the COVID crisis, there has been an unprecedented rise uh, in unemployment. And uh, you know, uh, since since March. And my question to you is very simple: How do you propose that we generate more employment opportunities? worldwide uh, 
uh, and and how do we solve this problem? I mean, it's one of the biggest problem that we've talked about quite a lot. But what's what are your views? I am looking forward to hear. So I'll start off with with uh, an extension maybe of the last conversation a little bit, and I and I think it is you touched on exponential uh, change, right? So I think as we elevate our mindset and we begin to move as we are, I believe, from the fourth industrial revolution to the fifth industrial revolution. The fifth industrial revolution tells us that we have these exponential technologies. We have these abilities to take quantum leaps. And what it tells us is we begin and we should compete for the benefit of humanity, not compete against each other. So if, if, I, if I put that as our foundation and we think about the youth, we think about our next generation. That's not our future tomorrow. That is our future today. So I think there's a couple of essential things that we need to think about. We need to think about healing. We need to think about some level of forgiveness. And I think that goes to the core of us as, um, I'd say, some of the older generation and taking personal responsibility for what we've done wrong. And we haven't done a good job of being a steward of our planet. We've messed it up pretty darn good, right? So we failed in our responsibility to our children, to our grandchildren, to our future generations, and to our planet. So the first step, I think, is recognizing what we've done wrong and owning that as a generation. And I think it is asking for forgiveness to our youth. They say, you deserve to be angry with us. You deserve to be upset. We failed, but help us. Now let's let's recognize that. Now let's come together to repair, right? And, it, and it's in the forgiveness and the recognition of our failure that I think we can move forward. And I think that becomes the foundation of how do we engage with our youth at a whole different level, right? Let's take down those barriers. Let's take down some of that anger. And it becomes about collaboration then. It becomes the power to me of this energy, this excitement, this brilliance of our next generation and marrying it to some of the wisdom of our other generations, right? And how do we have outcomes there that truly allow us to exponentiate, to take those quantum leaps for humanity? And while we're doing that, how do we rethink, how do we have systems change to create new jobs? You know, we could talk globally about the, the, the uh, phase that we're at from college graduation and the uncertainty of what is our job environment? My goodness, I can't even go for an interview. We talk about uh, corporations downsizing, streamlining. We're talking about a potentially a paradigm shift in work from home and how do we have remote connectivity and decentralized. I think, frankly, that plays so much to the power of our youth, right? When you talk about, my goodness, my kids, uh, you know, that are 26, 25, 19, and 16, wizards, wizards of technology, wizards of gamification. So I, I, I say it's to the youth to now take those talents and rethink about economies, think about what's important to them, what's important to their passions, how do they move the economy, the new economy to engagement around the issues that are important to them. And I think it's changing the mindset that attacking and solving for some of the biggest challenges around humanity are not just relegated to philanthropy. Let's create new business models, new engagements to, to go after even some of those moonshots that when we can then make some of the impossible possible. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Vince. And since we are talking about youth and passion at this point, let me bring a young voice uh, into the equation. And I have uh, Sangyukta, who is a young student and also member of our global volunteer community. And she has a couple of questions for you. So Sangyukta, please introduce yourself and ask your questions. I have to be really ready for Sangyukta now because I, I know this is, this is the tough questions that are coming now. Uh, thank you, Kunal sir. And uh, yes, sir, I 
I am really inspired by what uh, by what you said, and uh, it has been a very insightful discussion. And thank you for joining us. And so, talking about myself, I am an undergraduate student of economics in university in Delhi, and I'm passionate about. Um, all of the goals uh, of the sustainable development goals and especially like talking about sdg 8 since uh, i come from the background of economics this is like a prime focus and i really want to achieve something in this and contribute uh, towards this goal so coming back to the questions that i have um so i am like since i'm going to university i have been uh, given that privilege of going to a university but for girls of my age uh, to dream of a university and going into the financial sector and uh, like you know lead an organization in finances it's a very distant dream i'll say so um, since one of the uh, targets of this goal is to actually equalize uh, the genders and also bring everyone forward with equal pay and all equal working conditions so how do you think that i can as a youth uh, give them this opportunity and also give them the voice uh, to actually come forward and dream of going into the financial sector and making a difference in this world well, I, I'd say very respectfully, Sanyukta, you're doing it right now. And I, I think what we need is more Sanyuktas, right? So in it, your individual capacity, you are a catalyst. You are a beacon. Uh, you are a light. And, and we'll, we'll pull in from Diwali coming up soon. And, you know, one of my favorite festivals, and, 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 and I'm sorry that I, that I can't be there this year, but so much joy when we, we think about shining a light. Shining a light as an individual. And what are you doing by your leadership? You're taking personal responsibility for yourself. And I will tell you that dream, as you talk about it, I, I don't think it's so distant. I think what we're seeing is compression of uh, timelines to reach dreams. Because as there's been other women moving forward, other people of disadvantaged categories who are achieving greatness is setting the stage for others to follow in, 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 in uh, that pathway that you're blazing. So I think your personal leadership, your your determination to succeed, you're, you're looking, I suspect, at your education as a privilege. And when you look at it as a privilege and an honor and you achieve the highest levels of, of uh, internalizing that education and appreciating it, you resonate. You resonate levels of success that, trust me, as you sit today at this very moment, are inspiring others. So I think when we have this level of greater awareness at global corporations, greater awareness in politics, greater awareness with our, our population, that you're going to come more and more forward and find more opportunities, but frankly, create those opportunities. Chase your dreams and look at those dreams as achievable. And it may be just that idea, that, that entrepreneurial thought that you try out as part of what you're doing in, in your education, that you learn so much for outside of your college education that continues to make you the best that you can be. And I think by doing that, you will inspire so many. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, yes, I aspire to do so. Also, uh, going to the next question, uh, could you highlight out some three steps that I can take at the moment to contribute towards this goal and like uh, please like highlight it like three steps that I should take right now that can actually take me forward and you know uh, contribute towards the greater good. Well, the first thing I, I, I think I humbly suggest uh, to you and, and, and to so many that um, are, are our future, that are really our hope, right? 
to manifest yourselves, our planet, uh, really begin to think, uh, as, as I suspect you may be, the oneness of the planet, right? That we are all part of this beautiful planet. And if we start to think of ourselves perhaps as all individual cells within the same body versus individuals unto themselves, I think we begin to change our interaction. I think we begin to think about empathy and recognizing um, someone else's process, but to feel it, to let it resonate, and then to take action from that. So I think as we look at ourselves um, as being participants in the greater whole, when we begin to think about that, we think about solutions, how your own personal gifts and talents and blessings can be manifested to solve. And even just the simplest things uh, that we can share with one another, a smile, a greeting, it, it, it's engagement at the base level. And guess what? It doesn't cost us a whole lot or anything to take a little risk. And, we, and I like to talk about it as courageous vulnerability, right? We might stand in an elevator with one another and everybody's pretending no one else is there and we're looking this way, that way. Try it out. Just say, hi, a smile. And, and that moment in time, I think you will see someone say, oh, hi. Right? So we've just changed that engagement. We, we, we changed our interaction by things that aren't the moonshot. And if we can take simple acts of kindness and openness and we manifest that, I think in the aggregate of individuals doing that globally, we really begin to change the trajectory of how we conduct ourselves. Thank you so much, uh, Sangyukta, for your questions. And Vince, thank you so much for sharing such beautiful insights and helpful tips for the young and everyone else here. Now, uh, to sum up, uh, it's very difficult to sum up when uh, you know our conversation is so deep and steeped in so many insights, but I'll try my best. Uh, Vince has very clearly said that profit creates sustainability and profit can be uh, targeted towards purpose. And for, to do that, we need a new narrative and passion that allows new capital to move into the right direction. And a few other other things that, that came to my mind is, of course, that we need to demystify uh, SDGs and all the other things uh, that are part of these different goals and try and take that conversation more and more to the public so that we can ultimately be able to drive more public and private partnerships. We must have voices involved in the process and corporates or CEOs who are listening in, since consumers are becoming stakeholders now, you must move from nice to do to need to do. More and more, and, and all the entrepreneurs who are listening in, try and identify opportunities, opportunities that are there and broadcast them. That's where the collaboration will come from and capital will also move there. And last but not the least, as he said, move from being a consumer to being more contributors and move from conservation to regeneration. With that, Vince, we are almost towards the end of uh, our conversations, but since I'm a quiz master, I never run out of questions. So I have probably one last question for you. And that is, if you have to sum up your vision for a better world in one sentence, what would that be? Oh my goodness. That is a quiz master. Um, I think part of my challenge is I have too many words typically. Uh, I'd have to be more succinct, so you're really challenging me. You know, if I, if I had to really reflect for a moment and, and uh, let that resonate and receive that, Kunal, I think is we have to think about leading with an open heart first. And leading with our open heart allows us to receive and feel and awakens us from a 
a subconscious to moving to a conscious. And I think everything uh, perhaps flows from there. So I think it, if I had to say that one sentence, I think we all have to think about and embrace leading with an open heart. Wow. With an open heart, it's time to probably conclude the session. And everyone who is joining in and listening in, thank you so much. And I hope that all of you enjoyed the session. Remember, for a world where no one is left behind, it has never been clearer that all of us have a role to play in order to bring about change. Whoever you are, no matter where you come from, every one of us can make a difference. Every action truly counts. Get involved, attend the SDG Action Conclave 2020, participate in the SDG quiz, help raise awareness about the goals, and connect with the global community of passionate volunteers. This Global Goals Week, let us all come together to spread the knowledge about people, planet, and our sustainable development goals. Thank you once again all for joining us. Follow us on Instagram at Youth Forum India for all the updates. And don't forget to join our next session. Vince, thank you so, so much once again for joining us. Really, really pleasure. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kanasa, and Gupta. Thank you so, so much.